Hi everyone, my name is David. This is part three of my question and answer videos I do every single Monday. I'm answering people's questions from the last week, the last Q&A video. If you guys have a question, please ask me down below into the comment section down there. I'll answer it in the next Q&A video next Monday, okay? Let's just get started. Oh, I recommend things in part one. Uh, you might want to go watch the beginning of part one, okay? I re recommend things and make suggestions every week about things that can help you recover and heal and grow from emotional trauma, okay? Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so let's get started. The first question in part three is from Kathy in Anaconda, Montana. Thank you for telling us your locations. Please, everybody, tell us your locations. Even just drop in down there and just say, hey, I'm from here. I love it. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm dealing with empty nest syndrome. I've always worked so I've always worked so I focused on my job being a mom and wife. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's everybody left your house. Empty nest syndrome. A uh, common thing, really common I see uh, a lot of victims that come for my help uh, that have the uh, clients of mine that come to help come for help. Jeez, I can't talk real common thing for clients of mine to experience. There you go. Emptiness syndrome. And that's the woman who uh, works really hard taking care of the house and raising the children. What, a, what an amazing hard job. And then the narcissistic dad, boom, ups and leaves. Divorce. Leaves them for somebody else. Whatever it is. But right, it seems to be right around the same time and then the kids leave. Now they're all by themselves. Sad. I'll get to it. Uh, I was injured on the job and now I'm on disability due to PTSD. I have hobbies, etc., but why I'm feeling like I'm in mourning. In August, I've made an appointment with a psychologist for help, but a bit nervous. What can I expect from the first appointment? Um, I, I, I don't know why you're nervous. I don't know why people get nervous to talk to a professional that is there to help you, okay? There's no reason to be nervous, Kathy. The only reason you're nervous is, is probably your first time, right? So your brain doesn't know what to expect. Brain hates change. Anything different, we're going to die. Keep doing what you're doing. Stay together with your husband and the children. Bring them back. Keep it all the same. You ask me why you're in your morning, it's because something left, okay? And your children left and, and your husband. And I'm telling you guys, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Good or bad just doesn't work. It doesn't matter. I'm telling you. We, we, we grieve loss loss and, and it can be all kinds of different things that we lose that we grieve but it's the, the the more space and time something takes up and is gone we grieve it it's change our brain just hates it okay failed relationships are the worst abusive traumatic failed relationship it's the worst it's the worst grief okay you need that appointment that's great be excited about it. Nothing to be scared of. This, this is mom losing herself. Mom not expressing herself. Mom didn't tell people her opinion. Mom didn't ask for what she wants and needs and never got it. Mom took care of other people all the time and left herself out. Now is the time to find yourself and live your life for you, okay? This is what I wrote to Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Expect to be all about yourself. Finding who you are, what you want and need, expressing your opinion and what you value. Now the rest of your life starts and it's all about you now. Exciting. It's exciting. You're scared of just the unknown. That's all. This is the best part of your life now. Okay? Best part of your life now. Be open. Be excited. Be honest, be vulnerable. Okay, Kathy, you, you, you have nothing to fear, all right? This is finally gonna be all about you and it's just gonna be a little uncomfortable at first, but we gotta do it, okay? Start learning, start finding yourself and start learning to express yourself. You said you have hobbies, really start finding things that really interest you, Kathy, okay? Thanks, and I hope that works out with your therapist. I'm sure it will. If there's somebody, it, the worst thing is, Kathy, if they can't help you, you, you should start noticing that soon if they're not helping you. It's, it doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be anything against them. It may just not click, mesh. 
the, the therapist may not be healthy. You know, therapists are people too and they got problems too, okay? They aren't perfect, obviously. Um, so if it's not the right one, you just go find another one, okay? Good luck. Exciting. Steve from Australia, uh, I mean, Steve from Australia. A few questions. I've noticed that people with personality disorders tend to have friends who themselves are not healthy or they have a lot of acquaintance who don't know them well. They have a facade around these people. Is this just my experience or is this true for most borderlines and narcissists? It's true for us too, right? If we're dating unhealthy people, then we have other unhealthy people in our lives, like our friends, like our family. All my, all my clients do. Oh, every one thing in common that all my clients have, not that they've been abused by narcissists, it's that they, they all have some kind of unhealthy, um, unstable, or toxic, or just they're using them, you know, they have people like that in their lives. It starts in childhood, right? And it's, and it's familiar. If, if you have neglectful relationships in adulthood, then your parents neglected you in childhood. If you're neglected in childhood, you're going to have a neglectful relationships in adulthood. And that means everyone, friends, everyone included. Same with borderlines and narcissists. You can't be neglected more than a borderline. Borderlines have been so neglected, <clears throat> physically, everything. Narcissists have been neglected emotionally. Borderlines and narcissists have unhealthy Parents. Not bad. If you guys have a, a, a borderline narcissist child, I'm not saying you're bad. I'm saying you when you raised them, you weren't healthy. You weren't having your emotional needs met. You're probably in a toxic, neglectful marriage. You weren't healthy if you raised a borderline narcissist. Okay. So borderlines and narcissists grew up with unhealthy parents. That's normal to them. They're going to have be around unhealthy people. Also, they exploit people. They use people. I won't be used or exploited anymore in my life, so I won't have unhealthy borderlines or narcissists in my life. Guess who will? Victims who aren't healthy. There's, I hope that I'm starting to make sense here. Borderlines and narcissists are dependent on others. They need people, period. That's why if they have to, they'll accept anybody. I see all the time you guys would be like, man, I don't understand it. You know, I got my crap together. I went to school. I got a degree. I have a good job. I'm clean. I'm pretty. You know, I'm a good looking person, you know, and then they just went and dated a homeless drug addict that talks themselves and pees all over himself. Well, how, how do they do that? It, it, it's like a drug addict getting a, a bad drug, right? Um, drug addicts. I know that drug addicts that shoot up drugs every once in a while, they get, it's called like a hot, hot dose or something. Right? They got, they, they got some bad drug off the street. It's because if you're a drug addict, you're going to get high. And if that's all there is, this bad dope, they're going to do it. Narcissists are so dependent on people. If you and them are over, they'll go just with somebody else. They'll go get that bad person, that hot dose, that bad drug. That's all of this is, is dependency, guys. All of it. Just like I, I have clients that have said, you know, whenever my narc dumped me, I went and got laid. I went and had sex with someone else. You're addicted too. You're dependent too. See that? Uh, second question. Do you think therapy like DBT actually works for borderlines? If so, can they easily relapse to their old ways without regular maintenance? <clears throat> I ask because this, this disorder is a part of who they are. So I would imagine it would be a lot of work to change someone. Absolutely. A ton of work. And I, I really don't have an opinion on if DBT works for borderlines because I, I haven't been a part of it. I hope that makes sense. I don't, I, I don't have that experience. I don't know. I, some doctors say it works. Some doctors say it doesn't. But since I haven't done it, I don't know. I haven't done DBT therapy. I'm not borderline. And I, I've, I've heard some borderlines say they've done it and it helped them and all that. But I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I can tell you all kinds of reasons why it won't work, <laughs> but you know, we have to call you, you called it regular maintenance, but that's what we all do every day. We have to, man. We, we can reach some great place or learn something amazing or totally change ourselves, reinvent ourselves. 
totally. But we can go right back to our old ways, and 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 we do, and we have real, uh, you know, speed bumps and little little detours and things in life, and ups and downs, and two steps, you know, forward, one step back, and all this. And I use the example of um, Tibetan monks. They reach full enlightenment, enlightenment by the afternoon, completely enlightened a, a human being by 6 p.m. in the afternoon after dinner, right? But they go to bed and they have to do it all over again in the morning, okay? Because it's about who we are, right? Personalities, kind of who you are. To change that, to fix that, I can't imagine. But I will say that I think everyone in the world can better themselves somehow, okay? And so there's a lot of traits to borderlines that need to be helped and fixed and can be better. That's, that's the bottom line. Uh, and as you said, you never answered my question regarding your own life experiences, which you mentioned we're happy to share. Oh, I'm sorry. I remember you asking me and I forgot. I don't remember the exact question that you asked me now. Um, it, I think it had something to do with how I got here. So I'll just briefly tell you how I got here. Maybe that'll help Steve. And then any specific questions you have about my journey, please ask. I really, I really, um, like to share it's it's nice uh, i don't have anything bad or, or triggering or anything in my past that makes me sad or or anything anymore so i don't mind talking about it um i was abused abused most of my life i suffered from cptsd per, for probably at least 40 years um i'm 48 now i started healing from this just after turning 40. My last relationship, the last relationship I was in, the last time anyone ever abused me was about 10 years ago now. Um, my childhood, I was adopted. And the two people that adopted me, one was a narcissist and the other was schizophrenic. Quite a ride, let me tell you. Because of that, afterwards when I grew up in my adult life, I dated disordered, abusive women. I also had disordered, abusive friends. Um, had a 10 year relationship with someone highly disordered, highly abusive, and abused me and traumatized me for a very long time. Uh, this, there was no help, there's been no help available for me until I was in my 40s. Uh, there was no YouTube channels, there was no information you could look up. Um, narcissism you read in Greek mythology doesn't tell you anything uh, I majored in psychology or I majored in sociology minored in psychology none of that helped um, it wasn't until I found information that could help me understand so I could start healing and that's how I learned that that's what healing is um, I don't believe I suffered from any form of PTSD in a few years. I'm, I know I'm totally healed. I don't have anything in my past that bothers me or makes me feel bad or even uncomfortable. I understand all of it. I understand my life very well and I can explain it and what I've been through very well. I've healed myself and I can help heal others now. I hope that helps you, Steve. Please ask me any other questions that you have. And thanks for telling me I missed your question. I don't want to miss anyone's questions. And thank you for asking about me and my personal life. I appreciate that, that you're interested. Thanks, Steve. Next question is from watching YouTube. Is your name? I uh, don't know where you're from. Please, everybody, tell us your locations. Please tell us where you're from. Be general. No addresses. <clears throat> Something more than planet Earth would be awesome. What are your thoughts on people who cheat and blame it on being in a relationship with someone they label as a narcissist? I have seen many excuses where people refuse personal responsibility for their actions because the other person is a narcissist. Oh boy, could I just go on and on and on about this one. You guys will see it. You know, we call this a community, right? the narcissist community of victims who have been abused by narcissists or other disordered abusers. This is a community, isn't it? Quite a number of YouTube channels, a lot of them. And I just see 
so much contradiction. I see so much abuse, smearing. It's just gross. Like, just go down in the comment section. You'll see people just talking so badly of their ex. It's one thing to just list abuse and be general and, and not, you know, give names and stuff like that. But man, just the, oh, this person's absolutely horrible, narcissist, sick, you know, describing words, bad words. <clears throat> and then I see a lot of, um, I did nothing. I didn't do anything to deserve this. I was in a 10 year relationship and I never did anything wrong. You see that a lot like that. Um, but I get the others too, man. I think more I get the clients that accept all the responsibility. I see, I see that more. And what you find in enmeshed codependent relationships is you find the victim takes all responsibility. They're so enmeshed, everything has to do with them. They think everything is their fault. And there's something called um, reactionary abuse. And that's not to excuse the abuser at all or the victim who reactionary abuses. You abuse someone long enough they, they tend to fight back and react and abuse back. Okay? It happens. And it happens to victims who don't know how to remove themselves from danger. Victims that, that weren't taught to get out of the way, to run. And, you know, we've got two normal reactions to danger. Humans do. And that's, right, either fight or run. Parents teach children this by not letting them experience danger. Almost ever at all. So it's so foreign by the time you ever experience it when you're in your 20s or 30s, right? It's like, oh my God, what's this? It's like walking on a hot plate. Got to get out now. Fight for my life and run. But if you grew up in danger, if danger was a daily part of your life, such as you're five years old, four years old, six months old, doesn't matter. You're sitting there on the floor and you're dealing with thousands of different emotions that you can't regulate at all. So that everything is scary. You ever seen a child laugh so much they, cr they get scared? <laughs> like that. Even happiness is too intense for a child. So when they're hurting on the floor and they're being aroused and traumatized and the parents are fighting, arguing, hitting, yelling, hitting each other, Gone, hiding in bedrooms, asleep, high, drunk, working, not home. Jeez, I mean, so much, right? That's horrible. That child sits in danger. That child has danger as a normal part of their life. And they don't know what to do. They don't do anything. What can a child do? Not even a five-year-old can fight back. Not even a five-year-old can run out the door. You can't escape it. And if you live in danger and you can't escape it, you can't fight it, you freeze or fawn, right? The other two reactions, and that's for us. Freeze and fawn, that means do nothing. That means when you're in emotional abuse and someone's hitting you, you do nothing. That means when, when you've been molested as a child and you just sat there and took it, that means when somebody else wants to do it again to you, you just sit there and take it, let it happen. 70% of girls who've been molested in their childhood are raped in adulthood. Horrible statistic. Back to your answer. These are people that take no responsibility, okay? And it, it's a hard thing to do, you know? Um, it can be very difficult. Very difficult to know that you hurt someone, that you mistreated them, that you abused them. It's hard for anybody to accept but it takes a healthy person much more than a narcissist to do that. Thanks. Shannon from the Midwest. Hello, Shannon. How do you call out the narcissist in court without directly doing so? I plan to be in court here for another restraining order after the first one expires. Should I throw out terminology like triangulation, smear campaign, silent treatments, takes no responsibility, hoovering, and hope the judge will pick up, up on it? Last time the ex-narc did not do well in court became defensive and talked in circles. Therefore, the judge saw right through him and then you just let that happen again. Just let it happen again, Shannon, okay? Just let it happen again. He may not even show up. 
And another thing in this country, a lot of courts don't force you to show up. You may not have to. You may have to for a restraining order, okay? A lot of other incidences, a lot of other times, you won't have to because they've abused you. Ask your lawyer. I can't answer these questions for you, Shannon. These are legal questions you need to ask your lawyer about. I am not going to give you legal advice and it go badly. <laughs> I can tell you to heal. See a professional. Talk to them about this. Talk to them the day before, okay? Maybe see a doctor and you can take something if it's stressing you out so much. Judges, most of them are smarter than you think. Okay, the judges have been doing this for a long time. Okay, they've seen it all. I know that you guys say, oh, they know anything about narcissists. Yeah, but they know what hitting someone is. They know what lying and, and harassment, things like this. They understand those terms, okay? A lot of times being quiet in court can help you the most, but I cannot advise you. Okay, have your lawyer, good luck. David from Bath, United Kingdom. Should I ask for the ring back? I designed it and paid for it, never mind all the other stuff. Is it worth even trying to get it? It was all lies anyway, but still, I thought they I thought they'd chuck it back at you. <laughs> Not this time. It's a very cool ring. I wrote, Hi David, when you understand what you value, I hope you are at the top of that list. Not her, not the jewelry, and not a relationship with an abuser who doesn't love you. I'm sorry, David. I'm sorry for the whole experience, and I'm sorry for your loss. And I'm sorry for the loss of your money and your ring. It doesn't matter what you do, only how you feel about it. That's my best advice. You can ask for the ring back. You could try to get the ring back. You may not get it back. What's, the, what's most important? What really matters at all is how you feel, David, okay? Sometimes we put a price on our integrity. Sometimes we put a price on our mental health, on our future. Don't do that. Hope that helps. I don't know how else to answer that. I don't like to just tell people what to do, you know? Because what I would do doesn't mean that you should. I don't know the situations, you know, all of it. You can sit there and try to tell me, but I, I don't know. Really, David, it doesn't matter. And that, that's our, all of our problem. We've been raised that what matters is what we do. Uh, by conditional love, moving the goalpost. Not good enough. It doesn't matter. Write down everything you want in life and see how asking for that ring might conflict that. You might say, I'd like the ring back, I want money, I want this. Yeah, but you also gotta deal with this person who's probably exploited you and abused you. Okay? Um, yeah, I hope that helps, David. Thanks for asking, good luck. And I think that's it. Yep, that's it, guys. That's the end of my Q&A videos. Like I've been pounding to you, this causes people to commit suicide. Please support me and what I'm doing, okay? Support people doing this stuff. Subscribe to channels and, and like videos and share them. Put them in playlists, okay? Keep asking questions to heal though and tell me your locations. And anybody who needs coaching, daviddemars.com, okay? Thank you. Love yourself first. I'll see you guys next week. Take care.